morning. I wish I could take any credit if you do have a shorter wait time in a hospital. Unfortunately, uh, that would probably not be the case. I've uh, done a lot of work on hospital wait times, but uh, my ability to get hospitals to listen has been somewhat limited. So, But welcome uh, to day two of Dig and Delve 2019. Um, yes, I'm not John Patrick, but I am related. That's my father who spoke last night. Um, <clears throat> so it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the steering committee. And I think it's my task today to set the scene or to introduce uh, the day. Now, while I am listed on the steering committee, I have to admit for the last two months, I've been more uh, conspicuous by my absence than my presence in meetings. Um, and so that might explain why I, I didn't actually know I was giving this talk um, until I looked at the schedule on the website. Uh, so now I fully, I'm, I'm fairly confident that was my fault, not the steering committee's fault, because I'm sure at some point I agreed to do this talk, and as my wife would tell you, I'm not known for my memory. So. Um, Anyway, I think I, my, the justification for my being here is largely because most of my fellow uh, members of the steering committee are pastors, and I happen to be a mathematician. And as any mathematician will tell you, science is just applied mathematics. I am myself an applied mathematician, uh, and therefore not a real one. <laughs> real, real mathematicians tend to have very little concern as to whether what they do has any relevance to reality. Um, I'm reminded by my, of my favorite definition of uh, a mathematician um, as one who solves problems you never knew you had in ways that you don't understand. So. <laughs> now, now, typically, mathematical propositions take place in a world of their own. You make up a number of axioms about this fantasy world, and then you see what you can prove within that space. So, as an example, Let's take the real number line. Whoops, wrong way. So there's the real number line. It's proved to be very useful in reality, but it's admittedly a little boring. So mathematicians said, well, why don't we, instead of a number line, let's create a number space. And we'll create this space by creating a second line that is related to i, which we call is equal to the square root of negative 1. Right. So we know that neg square root of negative one makes no abs any sense whatsoever, but we don't really care. And then we're going to see, well, within this space, right, we can do all kinds of things and create all kinds of new numbers um, and, and uh, prove all kinds of very interesting things that have no relevance to reality. So, um, <laughs> now, what is, what is truly amazing, though, is that so often these mind games of mathematicians, including imaginary numbers, by the way, turn out to find a foothold in reality. Despite their best efforts at irrelevance, time and again, the work of these theoretical mathematicians gets turned into something useful, usually by the physicists or the engineers, not the mathematicians. But. Now the question is, is this just a happy coincidence? The surprise isn't, by the way, just that mathematics describes the universe, but even more so that the equations that appear to work so well are relatively simple, though you may not believe me on that one, so that we can actually do something with them. If we were to look at the set of all possible equations, the subset of equations that would actually be useful is vanishingly small. I, I thought about giving you a mini lecture on measures, set theory and measure zero, but um, I thought if I did that, I might actually... Um, make my father's definition of a professor come true today, which is, if you remember that from last night. But again, is this a happy coincidence that our universe not only displays an order that can be described mathematically, but that that order is in fact amenable to our understanding? Albert Einstein actually put it very well uh, when he said, you find it strange that I consider the comprehensibility of the world to the degree that we may speak of such comprehensibility a miracle, 
Well, a priori, one should expect a chaotic world, which cannot be in any way grasped through thought. The kind of order created, for example, by Newton's theory of gravity is of quite a different kind. Even if the axioms of the theory are posited by a human being, the success of such an enterprise presupposes an order in the objective world of a high degree, which one has no a priori right to expect. That is the miracle that which grows increasingly persuasive with the increasing development of knowledge. I would suggest that that is the argument we are attempting to unpack in this conference. It is the very success of science, we, will, we want to argue, that presupposes the existence of a creator. From the talks on fine-tuning to start the day to the refutation of methodological naturalism at the end, we are seeking to push back against the notion that belief in God is somehow antithetical to a proper understanding of science or that somehow faith gets in the way of scientific progress. Now, it is certainly undeniable that at times, men in positions of authority within the church have proven a hindrance to science. But then again, it could be equally argued that Aristotle was an even greater hindrance to science as it was respect for his authority that held back science for quite a while. Human beings mess up. It is one of the things that we do best. But let me suggest to you that faith in itself, the belief in a rational creator as revealed in scripture, rather than being a hindrance to science, was in fact the soil within which science was able to flourish. As my father pointed out last night, um, it is no coincidence that experimental science began and took off in Christendom. For as the humanist human Butterfield put it, if Newton had not had his God, he would not have gone looking for his laws. Part of the modern mistake, I, I believe anyway, is that we somehow came to believe that science provided us with a different and more certain way of knowing. Instead, what I want to suggest today is that science narrowed a, our knowledge to a particular subset, namely the material, and suggest that, suggest is that science narrowed this and then held up a standard of knowledge, one devoid of assumption and belief, that not even science could meet. Consider what I began with. The mathematical knowledge proceeds from a given set of axioms in order to derive a given set of conclusions. One could, in fact, argue that all, science, all mathematical proofs are, in fact, tautologies because the conclusion is buried in the premises. And in fact, if nothing can be assumed, then nothing can be proved. It is no different within science. All scientific endeavor occurs within a framework of belief. We move forward on the basis of a confidence in past knowledge that we do not verify. Uh, to summarize this, uh, there's a, a guy called Richard Lewontin, who was an atheistic evolutionary zoologist, so he, uh, and he put it uh, this way. No serious student of epistemology any longer takes the naive view of science as a process of Baconian induction from theoretically unorganized observations. There can be no observations without an immense apparatus of pre-existing theory. Before some experience become observations, we need a theoretical question. And what counts as a relevant observation depends upon a theoretical frame into which it is to be placed. Repeatable observations that do not fit into an existing frame have a way of disappearing from view and the experiments that produce them are not visited. I would suggest anyway that that's part of the explanation for uh, the answer to one of the questions yesterday as to why evolution continues to hold such sway in the scientific community. But, um, I, would suggest that, that I would suggest also that uh, knowledge, um, or the, the accumulation of knowledge, is a bit like playing a game of Sudoku. I don't know, if you haven't played the game of Sudoku, it consists of a nine by nine board in which you have to get uh, all no numbers one through nine in every row, every column, and every three by three box. A player of the game will attempt to logically deduce a value um, for any given tile, and then will proceed on the assumption that what they had previously logically argued through, is in fact correct. At some point, you may run into contradictions and you have to go back and retrace and find out where it was that you started to go wrong. The process is an unraveling of everything you thought you knew in order to get back to some point at which you can then proceed again. I would submit that this is not a bad analogy for how knowledge is achieved through any discipline. We proceed as best we can to coherently build out of a prior set of beliefs and we only re-examine those beliefs when we run into contradiction. Take, for example, the geocentered universe. 
Ptolemy at the time had developed a fairly ingenious model where the Earth was stationary at the center of the universe. It was, in fact, fairly intuitive. After all, we don't experience any movement of the Earth. But as more and more observations led to more and more complexities being added to the model, some began to question whether we needed to re-examine some of the basic assumptions behind it. It is worth noting that the assumption that complexity was a sign of error is rather a strange one. Why should we have expected that planetary motion could be described in relatively simple systems? And were Copernicus and Galileo certain of the sun-centered model? I don't see how they could have been. For after all, until Kepler came along with, and fixed the orbits, the model didn't actually predict all that well. They were convinced, I would argue, as much by its elegance as by its predictive power. They believed in a god of order and thus anticipated a world that was readily explainable. Rather than a hindrance, their faith formed the background belief that motivated their science. Now what happens if we accept that uncertainty, it, there is uncertainty in every aspect of knowledge? That we know only within a framework of belief whether we are dealing with ethics or particle physics. Now it is certainly true that the narrowing of knowledge to the material within the scientific realm certainly gives it an advantage as in such a field, it is much easier to determine contradictions and therefore to figure out where we've gone wrong. But it was a strange leap in logic to thus claim that any knowledge outside of science did not exist, particularly if we, particularly if we accept that the means of knowledge is the same. Belief preceding knowledge that is corrected through contradiction. So the question is, does science make more or less sense within a system of belief that assumes the presence of a rational creator? To that, I'm going to turn to an unusual source uh, in that he was a literature professor, but uh, C.S. Lewis put it well. When I accept theology, Lewis wrote, I may find difficulties at this point or that in harmonizing it with some particular truths derived from science. But I can allow for science as a whole. Granted that reason is prior to matter and that the light of that primal reason illuminates finite minds, I can understand how men should come by observation and inference to know a lot about the universe in which they live. If, on the other hand, I swallow the scientific cosmology as a whole, then not only can I not fit in Christianity, but I cannot even fit in science. If minds are wholly dependent on brains and brains on biochemistry and biochemistry in the long run, on the meaningless flux of atoms, I cannot understand how the thoughts of those minds should have any more significance than the sound of the wind in the trees. Christian theology can fit in science, art, morality, and the sub-Christian religions, the scientific point of view cannot fit in any of these things, not even science itself. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Faith properly understood, therefore encourages rather than discourages scientific exploration. It gives us a confidence that our world is not only explicable, but that our minds can reasonably be expected to understand it. Atheism, one could argue, is now being forced into a time plus chance of the gaps type argument. As evidence mounts of the elegant simplicity and order that amazed Einstein, the atheist is forced to suggest that given enough time and a bit of luck, anything is possible. The conclusion is not based on any sound scientific argument, but rather due to a primary commitment to a world without a God, fueled, I would argue, in part, by a mistaken belief that allowing a theistic explanation would somehow betray the scientific cause. I would argue that belief, rather than forcing us away from the material explanation, gives us a reason to believe that it is there to be discovered. Except in rare circumstances, it seems that God has chosen to work through materialistic causes. Thus, it is not that the theistic scientist would throw up his hands and say, well, it must be God, therefore I don't need to go looking for a natural explanation. Rather, the theistic scientist looks at the world and wonders, how did God do that? And then proceeds to look for the natural explanation. The search for natural causes is therefore more rational for the theist than for the atheist. The elevation of science as the only means to knowledge and the refusal to accept that all knowledge falls short of certainty and, it, and is upheld by belief has had some troubling consequences. Initially, it was only knowledge outside of science that came into question, but inevitably, even scientific truth was questioned. 
Science came to be viewed by many merely as a means to power as opposed to a search for truth. Just because it works doesn't necessarily mean um, that it is true. And what is held to be true may simply be the views of those who currently hold power. Like the proverbial man who cuts off the branch upon which he is sitting, the, the skepticism or the general skepticism of knowledge outside of science eventually turned on scientific knowledge itself. Perhaps it is better to say that the certainty that the supporters of science demanded of the other d disciplines was eventually shown to not even be possible within science. Even such an ardent uh, supporters of science as Bertrand Russell saw the consequences of where this pervasive skepticism was leading. While science, as the pursuit of truth, or uh, pursuit of power, becomes increasingly triumphant, science as the pursuit of truth is being killed by a skepticism which the skill of the men of science has generated. That this is a misfortune is undeniable, wrote Russell, but I cannot admit that the substitution of superstition for skepticism would be an improvement. Skepticism may be painful and may be barren, but at least it is honest and an outcome of the quest for truth. No real escape is possible by returning to the discarded beliefs of a stupider age. I like Russell primarily because he's always very forthright. Thus, I would say in an ironic twist, the Enlightenment Project, as my father prefers to say, the Endarkment Project, in its futile attempt to provide mankind with sure and certain knowledge, instead succeeded in removing all hope of finding knowledge and replaced it with a pervasive skepticism that inevitably, in my mind, led to the cynicism that we find in postmodernism. Surely there is some evidence that we have gone wrong somewhere along the way. And this is where we sh should, I think, go back to earlier ages, those stupider ages, as Russell would have them be, and look at what, how they understood knowledge. Um, and I want to quote to you Anselm of Canterbury, who said, I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but I believe in order that I may understand. For of this I feel sure, that if I did not believe, I would not understand. Whereas the modern experiment would have us eschew all belief, as if that were possible, and look dispassionately and impersonally at the world, Anselm exhorts us to believe and see where that belief might take us. More than that, he claims that if we don't do as much, we won't learn or come to any kind of knowledge whatsoever. Faith is prior to reason and in fact gives reason the foundation upon which it can act. Our task as honest searchers after truth is not, as Russell would have us do, to doubt everything that can be doubted, but rather to be open to the possibility that what we have chosen to believe could very well be wrong. In other words, our task is to be open to the contradictions that may lead to a revision of our cherished beliefs. As Michael Polanyi wrote, I hold it to be fully consistent with my belief in the transcendent origin of my beliefs that I should be ever prepared for new intimations of doubt in respect to them. This may prevent us from saying anything with absolute certainty, but then that is what makes life interesting. It is risky to stake your actions on what you have chosen to believe but cannot definitively claim as true. I would ar argue that this calls us to a humble confidence. Right? Humble because it is not certain, but confidence because if we do not commit to our beliefs, we will not get anywhere. As Jesus says in John's Gospel, he who sets out to do my will will know whether I come from the Father. In other words, he says, live as if he, he is who he says he is and see if the act of doing that does not lead you into greater and greater assurance and indeed confidence. If he is not who he says he is, then it will lead to just those contradictions that force us to re-examine our beliefs. Thank you very much.